Good morning, everyone. Figured I'd get logged in early and make sure everything's good to go. That's if anybody shows up. <laughs> Hey, Greg, I've been fine, man. How have you been? There's a time delay here, so we just kind of bear with it. I think it's something like almost 30 seconds. Just checking the interface, making sure everything's going to be good to go. Sure, I can go big, go wide, right, left, drawing pad, me in the bottom corner, drawing pad, we'll go out and just wait for a few people to get logged in here. Good morning, Mohamad. I apologize if I screwed that up. Oh, Greg, you passed it. You you passed. Took two attempts. Well, took me three. So I guess you're you're at least a you're two thirds smarter than I am. Avankash, good morning, sir. We will kick this off uh, here very shortly with regard to our discussions. We're going to be talking this morning about layer three handoff. Now, um, just so everybody knows, um, I ran into a problem in my internal Eve build as far as my vManage environment. So actually, from my data, from my studio that I'm sitting in right now, which is a 20 by 12 building on my, on, on my farmette, I actually have a 150-foot armored patch cable that's running from this building to my data center. So I had to tap into another server. So I'm praying to God... You know, uh, one of the kids or something doesn't unplug uh, anything for us, but uh, we shall effort to uh, make certain that all of this works. But, you know, sometimes we just simply got to do what we got to do. I want to wish everybody a good morning, a good afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever you guys are. And uh, I'm very, very tickled that so many people are interested in uh, these live sessions. I'm going to continue these. Um this has actually been kind of fun for me as far as uh, introducing. I was very, very nervous the first time, but it wasn't all that different than teaching a normal class. So uh, like I said, I want to welcome everyone, and we are going to be talking about Layer 3 handoff today, and I want to be able to do that in some context. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pop up my screen here with me off to the uh, left-hand side. And what I want us to look at is I want us to look at the lab that I'm using because there's not a lot to it. What I'm going to do is I am going to drag a picture of my data center, or I'm sorry, my enterprise infrastructure lab. Now, guys, there's not a lot to this. There's a server with a single switch connected to it. Now, the reason that I'm able to pull this off is that I am using... CSR 1000 Vs as my border node in my SDA environment. For me, this was like finding the holy grail because I have been trying to find a way to help people build a home lab that doesn't cost a fortune. Now, uh, when I took and passed my CCIE routing and switching exam, my first CCIE, I spent almost $5,000 on equipment. I built, I had routers, I had switches, I had to have a rack, I had to have power management, I had to have um, everything to include, you know, specialized serial cables back in my day and things along those lines. And it really added up and it added up really quickly. And then along came a solution called Dynamips Dynagen. And Dynamips Dynagen allowed us to be able to emulate devices and resources. 
Now, through the emulation of those devices and resources, I found that I was using my physical rack less and less and using virtualization more and more. But the problem was, is in the early days of emulation, those packages were kind of hit or miss. You almost had to determine whether or not you had a problem in your routing or you had a problem in the emulation environment. And over the time, obviously, this has gotten better and better and better with the introduce, introduction of technologies like EVNG, Cisco CML2, um, <clears throat> GNS3 is now a big thing. You know, um, the, the, the uh, Dynamips Dynagen Users Group basically acquired everything from Kristoff and, and they built their own solution. And the key element here was is the cost of learning technologies dropped massively. And then along came Cisco, and Cisco introduced the idea of data center, where virtually nothing can be emulated in the data plane. And for the longest time, that never impacted route switch. But now today it does. It impacts routing and switching from the perspective of wanting to study about these SD infrastructure, software-defined WAN, software-defined access. And what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to find a way to be able to create the most affordable lab environment humanly possible. And this on the screen right now is what I've found. I have a single 3650 that I bought about three months ago for about, let's say, 200 bucks. And I have a server that is run me about 20, well, actually, that server I bought for $2,900. It is a R630 that has two Xeon CPUs in it, gives me 80 virtual CPUs when it's all said and done, and it has 512 gigs of RAM in it. Now, the reason that I'm bringing this up is, is that server is both my SD-WAN environment, it's going to be my CSRs that I'm using in my environment, and it's also my DNAC and my ICE engine, all rolled into one solution. So what you're seeing on my screen right now is my equivalent of my rack that I built when I was studying for routing and switching. And I've been trying to get it down to the smallest footprint humanly possible. Now, if I get rid of that drawing and I go into my vCenter environment, what I want to do is I want to call your attention to 10.1.0.117. That is that server that's sitting on top of that chest freezer that I have in my front room. And that server is running a core router. It is running a CP border node which is a CSR1000V. Now, if you check the compatibility matrix coming from Cisco, the CSR1000V is only able to be used as a control plane node. However, the problem is, is people read those compatibility mat matrices and say, well, I can't do that. Well, if you try it, sometimes it's going to work. What Cisco's saying is, is it's not purpose-built to be a border node. They're not saying it won't work. They're saying they're not going to support it in production. Well, we don't give a rat's butt about production. We're all about trying to be able to lab. Now, bear in mind, there will be some fundamental differences between using a CSR for free and a 9300 for about two grand or a 3850 for about 600 or some other device that you can get your hands on. I don't recommend anything. I tell students all the time, if you're going to buy switches to emulate in your environment, don't worry about the 9300. The 9300 only gives you fabric in a box. And the difference between a fabric in a box and a control plane border node is, is clicking a third option. So it's not like there's a lot of configuration that goes into it. So my recommendation is, is that if you're going to buy devices and you have the money to build a nice lab, buy 3850s. 3850s are going to run you about five to six hundred dollars, depending on what deals you can find. Scratch and dents are easily even cheaper on eBay. And as a direct result of that, that device can be a border node, it can be a control plane node, it can be an edge node, it can be a border and a control plane, but it cannot be a border control plane and an edge all at once. In other words, it doesn't support fabric in a box, which is not a big deal. I'll show you guys that in a subsequent live, maybe later on. We might do that next week. So the goal of all of this is to try to prove to people that it is not outside of the scope of being able to build a home lab in order to be able to study and use these technologies. Later on, I'll show you if you don't have a DNAC, it doesn't mean that you can't study. I'll teach you guys how to do that, and we'll have lives on those sessions. Now, I know not all of you guys are here for enterprise infrastructure, but enterprise infrastructure is where I am seeing the most traction and the most interest. So uh, when I talk about it, I'm not saying that, you know, um, 
everybody's going to be interested in it, but a SDA environment is an SDA environment, whether you're looking at it from the perspective of a specialist certification, just wanting to know it, or wanting to implement it for the purposes of CCIE enterprise study. Now, uh, the, the main goal of today's exercise is, is to build a Layer 3 environment, and that Layer 3 environment is going to involve a Layer 3 handoff. Now, what I'm going to do is right here, you see in my lab, I have a home lab V DNAC. It's a virtual DNAC. Uh, it is running inside of ESXi. If we look at that machine, I've given it a buttload of CPUs. It's running something like 62 CPUs and 256 gigs of RAM and 600 gigs of storage. If you're going to build your own, make sure that you at least have 100 gigs of solid state drive capability, preferably one terabyte. That's what I do. I actually have six terabytes in this server just because I had the drives laying around. But it's not necessary. I'm trying to, again, demonstrate the fact that you can create a home lab in a relatively affordable footprint. And if you can't afford the server, you can still learn as much as humanly possible to where if you have to rent a server or if you're lucky enough to snag one of the workshops or something like that, then uh, it's going to minimize the amount of effort it's going to require to be able to continue your studies. So this DNAC is actually this guy right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into it. I'm going to log into admin, and I use ISIS Cool as my credentials. And <clears throat> once I get access to this DNA center, what we're going to do is we're going to use the DNA center to start our conversations. Now, I'm going to do this more from a perspective of demonstrating a part, and then I'll ask questions. But bear in mind, there is a time delay that I'm still getting used to. I'm used to being able to ask a question immediately on Zoom or something like that and get a response back. Uh, in the SD Geek site, we do lives occasionally, and it's the exact same thing. So when it comes down to YouTube, uh, I can do ultra low latency, but the problem with that is, is that every become, everything becomes granular and pixelated, and, and I don't have good uh, screen capture. So what I want us to do right now is I want to talk about these devices, and I want to point these devices out. So first and foremost, again, like I said, when I look at my Catalyst device, that's it right here. It's sitting on top of the server with two cables connected to it. One of them is a rollover cable for the console control, which is actually connected to a Windows machine running inside of the ESXi environment. And the second cable has actually been moved. This is an old picture. I moved it from port 24 to port 1. And this is the interface that I'm used to be able to discover this device. Now, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about discovery. Because we can't do squat. We can't build a layer 3 environment. We can't do VXLAN overlays. We can't do anything until the DNAC knows about devices in our infrastructure that we want to use it to monitor or control. And there's a key stipulation there. Because remember, inside of the DNA center, there are two fundamental operational constraints. There's the Cisco network data platform, and there's the Cisco network control platform. Control is automation. Data is assurance. So the NDP is the assurance engine, which gives me the capability and be able to monitor the performance and capability of all the devices that the DNAC knows about, whether the DNAC can actually reach out and configure them or not. The NCP, the network control platform, is built for the purposes of automation. And that's really and truly what this DNA center is. The DNA center is just simply a second brain. Instead of me having to log into 10 devices and put configuration commands on those devices, all I do is I tell the D in a center that I want it to do it for me and let it do it. And we do that through policy, through templates, and through the assignment of role-based behaviors. And that's the things that we need to talk about. But right now, inside of my DNA center... We have no devices that we know about, and unless we know about devices, we can't control them. Let's look at that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to provision, and I'm going to look in devices under inventory, which is the default screen. And we're going to see here I have no devices that exist here. And if I look inside of my fabric that I built called Super University, what we're going to see here is there's nothing in here at all. So what we've got to do, first of all, is we have to introduce the DNAC to the devices that we want it to know about. And of those devices, a subset of them may or will be devices that I want to use the DNA center to control.
So what we're going to do is I am going to go to the Tools button over in the right-hand corner. I'm going to click it, and I'm going to execute a discovery operation. A discovery operation is going to be where I tell the DNAT to go out and connect to devices and resources. Students ask all the time, well, how does the DNAC do that? Well, the DNAC can use Telnet, SSH, preferably, and by default, it will use SSH. It will also leverage the capability of HTTPS, HTTP functionality. If I want to be able to do things like uh, implement configurations required for, say, Thousand Eyes, it will also use SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, version 2C in order to be able to implement configurations commands and also to be able to do monitoring. Now, the way that we do that is, is we create a discovery process. Now, I've already made one, but I'm going to talk about it. So in this instance, what we see here is I have an iOS XE discovery process. That iOS XE discovery process is doing this. It's going out and it's connecting via SSH and SNMP to devices that have IP addresses that fall in the range that I have defined here. These are loopback addresses, just because that's my preference. You could have used, I could have used a physical set of devices and resources. However, in older versions of DNAC, when I have opted not to use loopback interfaces in production environments, sometimes I have some problems instantiating some of those role-based behaviors that I was describing earlier. So when we look at what's going on in the context of this device, I want to add these resources. Now, I ran this before just to make sure that everything was going to be good to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it again. And I'm going to click Rediscover, and I'm going to tell the DNAC to start this process and start it now. Now, when it runs, you'll notice up here it says it's queued. And ultimately what I want to see is I want to see this device get discovered and I want to see all of these discoveries to be successful. Now, we see here we're in progress still, and we'll wait for it. Now it's complete. And it says, hey, Terry, I found two devices. I found a device called BRCP Border 1, and I found a device called Branch 1 Edge 1. Now, again, we can see I've got green check marks across the board. I have CLI access. SNMP communication was working. ICMP echo reply, reply worked. Everything was pingable. Everything was good to go. And we have a green check for positive status. Now, what this means now is, is the DNAC went out, connected those devices, ran configuration commands against those devices, learned about them, and added them to my operational inventory. Now, in order to be able to see that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the Cisco data center logo here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to provision, and I should see in the unassigned devices two new resources. These resources are going to be C branch one CP border one, branch one edge one. So we now know about these devices, and we know what these devices are. So as an example, the system is going to say, well, uh, BR Edge 1 showing up as an unknown device role. But notice here it says it's still in progress. So just because we see everything here that is on the screen with the right names does not mean the process is complete. My advice to anyone, whether you're taking the lab, whether you're working in a production environment, is, is that the very moment that these devices say managed for every device that I discovered, if I found two devices or if I found 20 devices, wait till they say managed before you do anything. And if you're impatient like me, you can always click the refresh button and ultimately you should see everything showing up as managed. Unless you see managed, do not do anything else at this time because you do not know whether or not all of the background functions and services that the DNAC is going to be doing for me, remember I said it was a second brain, is done. So once this is taken care of, we want to make certain that these devices are managed. Now, the issue that I have here is, is these devices are currently unassigned. Now, what we have to talk about right now is the fact that when I find a device, that device now exists in the database, but when I want that device to exist in the network, in other words, I want that device to do a job for me, I have to take into account the fact that there needs to be a representational state that is going to define where that box is, where that device is. So where is that CSR-1000V? Is it in Mumbai? Is it in, you know, Herndon, Virginia? Is it in Richardson, Texas? Is it in San Jose? And if I have 10 devices in San Jose... 
does that necessarily mean they're all in the same place? No. So what we need to do, we need to create something referred to as our hierarchy. Now, I've already done it. I'm going to take a look at the design tab. Under the design tab, we're going to see that I have an organizational call, organization called Super University, and I have two buildings in Super University. So what I'm doing is I'm going to be building a university campus. Now, the, this university campus is going to have buildings that are going to be located in different places, and right now, what these places are going to be in RTP, Research Triangle Park, which is going to be you know where the old testing center was, a place that's near and dear to my heart. Now, I've, I've done a lot of crying and a lot of celebrating in that center. Well, I've celebrated twice. I've cried a whole lot more. But the object of what we're trying to do here is, is we need to understand that these devices need to be assigned to these different buildings and to these different floors. Now, because we don't cover wireless in enterprise infrastructure, I don't really worry about floors that much. But if I if I onboarded my virtual wireless LAN controller and I had access points that were connected specifically to that 3650 that I illustrated, that I showed in that drawing or that picture, then obviously, you know, I'd probably want to put floors. We'd take a look at, may, for instance, some heat maps and things along those lines. But right now, that's not part of our conversation. I want to get to the point where we we can talk about configuring a layer three out because I'm not going to log into any of these devices and enter commands via the command line. I want to be able to do this using policy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cycle through this and take a look at the things that I've defined because everything in DNA is based on network hierarchy. So devices will exist in floors. Floors will exist in buildings. Buildings will exist in sites or areas. Areas will exist in regions and things along those lines. And that is all logically defined by us. And I've built one very simple. I've made one big campus with two buildings. It could be one campus with three buildings. It could be one campus that exists in multiple locations. Uh, excuse me. It could be one university with campuses in multiple locations. And then I could create something called a distributed fabric site architecture. So... What I want to I highlight here is, is that there are things that need to be defined. So as an example, if I go to network settings and I look at network settings, what we're going to find is, is I am going to have AAA configurations, my ICE engine that is going to be integrated and functional. It needs to be defined. It needs to be an, a resource because when the DNAT goes and configures AAA on devices that I want it to manage, it needs to know what information to provide. I have to define that, and that is part of my design hierarchy. When I scroll down and I take a look at other things, I have DHCP servers, DNS servers. I've got my do domain name, SNMP, NTP, syslog, NetFlow, whatever options and features and capabilities that you want to implement are defined here for implementation during future op operations. Now, in newer versions, this is this is this version is the version they're using in the lab. It's 1317. It's old as dirt. And the newer versions are going to give us even more capabilities and more functions. But right now I stick with this one because that's what 999 percent of my student base is interested in, and that's going to be taking and passing either a specialist lab or a specialist exam or the CCIE infrastructure lab. So when we look at this, I've also got to define credentials because remember, we said that the DNAC had to log into those devices. And if I'm going to SSH to the device, I have to have a password. I have to have a username. That's defined here. My read-write communities have to be defined inside of the DNA center. It's all part of design. And design is single-handedly the most important and possibly the most overlooked feature and responsibility as administrators and subject matter experts in the DNA center space when we first start because we're used to being able to do a lot of stuff footloose and fancy-free at the command line. So when we look at what's going on, again, I also need IP addresses. So what I do in my environment is, is I defined a large pool of IP addresses. I mean, it's big. I mean, it's 100.0.0.0 slash 8. And then what I do is I go to the different locations, like building one, and I carve out a subset of those addresses. In other words, I'm letting the DNA center handle the subnetting for me. I'm just telling it what my gateway of last resorts are going to be, what my DNS servers are going to be, and then later on in a deployment, I'll leverage these. And they can be different. So as an example I've got for building one, if I wanted building two to have a completely different set of resources, or maybe the first half of a block of addresses, I define that here. And again, it all carries through. We're not going to worry about quality of service mechanisms. Wireless is not part of our conversations right now, but we have lots of capabilities and a lot of things that we can tie into.
The next thing that I also want to talk about is going to be policy because remember, we said we had a AAA. Well, I have an ICE engine that's integrated into my platform. I can see that by going to system settings. And when I scroll down from the system settings, notice here it's telling me that I do have an ICE engine integrated. I have a video on how this is integrated. And we also have classes on the SD Geek site that is going to walk you through building your own environment if you so choose. So once that integration takes place, and once everything is done, again, I'm ready to move on. This integration is necessary because when I want to deploy these resources, the DNAC needs to know what configuration commands to apply to them. Now, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my vCenter environment, and I'm going to open up a session to my CP border node, remember, which is a CSR 1000V. So if I come over here, let me... My laptop's in the way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say from the perspective of this device, Ian, and ice is cool. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say show IP interface brief. And you'll notice that I've got IP addresses that pre-exist on gigabit 1 and gigabit 2, but gigabit 3 has no interfaces. We're going to use that for our layer 3 out, and we're going to let the DNAT configure it for us. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to say show... IP OSPF neighbors, and we'll see that I have an adjacency with a router that exists. That's my transport router, which is going to be 0001. That's my core router. And I also have an adjacency with a device that's running 100.124.0.12. That's my uh, 3650. Note, I'm not running ISIS. Everybody has ISIS wrapped around their brain. They think that it's absolutely necessary to run ISIS in the underlay because it's DNA center. Well, that's bogus. All right. The only time that you're ever positively, absolutely 100% required to run ISIS in the underlay is when you do a LAN automation, which you cannot do using a router as a border node. That's one of the benefits of having like a 3850 or say, for instance, a um, 9300 in order to be able to do a LAN automation. And I have videos on how that process takes place. But understand, you know, that, you know, there are questions that have to be asked that are going to be related to the idea and the principle of design. So with this implemented, with the configuration in place, the only other thing I want to do is I'm going to say show, run, pipe, and I'm going to say include triple A. You'll notice here that triple A new model is on. Nothing is configured right now. There's just baseline configuration in here. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to execute two other show commands. I'm going to type show. Let me click on my black screen here. I'm going to say show run pipe section BGP. Notice the only thing I have is an SNMP trap. And I'm going to say show run pipe section lisp location id separation protocol and again all i have is an snmp trap enabled so right now there's no configuration on this device and we want to change that so what i'm going to do is i am going to take the first step the first step is going to require me to go back in the dna center and what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back to my provisioning tab i'm going to find these two devices and what i'm going to do is i am going to assign them I'm going to pick both of them right now, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to actions. I'm going to go to my, uh, my provision, and I'm going to say I want to assign these devices to a site. Remember I said that we had to have a hierarchy, so these resources are undefined, so right now they show up in the unassigned. What we want to do is we want them to show up in their building. I'm going to put them both in building one, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say – I'm going to choose the site. I'm going to go to Super University. I'm going to pick Building 1. I'm going to come down here and hit Save. I'm going to go ahead and assign. I'm going to do that to both. And they should disappear out of this database. They didn't go away. The system didn't forget them. The system moved them from the unassigned to the assigned. So if I go to Super University and I go to Building 1, I should see my two devices right here. What we've got now is we have these two devices that are sitting inside of building one, and they also exist in the fabric that I've already created. I don't want to have to walk you guys through all phases of this. So let's talk about fabric. What is an SDA fabric? Well, an SDA fabric 
is my overlay. What we've just done is we put devices and resources that are running routing protocols and handling their configurations, and those devices are able to communicate with each other and do everything that they've always done. But anything that I want to use the DNAT to control and manage, I'm going to need to have an overlay, and that overlay is going to be VXLAN tunnels existing inside of LISP IP tunnels. We need to talk about that. So what I'm going to do is I've got, a, I've got a fabric here called Super University, and I built it on Building 1. Building 2 is going to be a second fabric site. Now, right now, when I take a look at these devices, the DNAC just knows about them. They're not doing a role for the DNAC. The DNAC can monitor them. So if I click on a device, let's say I click on this border node, and I take a look at my configuration here, all I have done is I have assigned them. Notice it says device needs to be provisioned to the site before the roles can be assigned. So in other words, what the DNAC is telling me is it can't control it because they have been assigned, but they have not been provisioned. That's the next step of this. So provisioning is going to be where I prepare the device to do a job for me. So as an example, I want this ultimately to be a border and a control plane node. I want this one to be an edge node. Now, what we want to do now is make that happen. So I'm going to go back to devices uh, inventory on this floor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my CP border first. Since these are two different classifications of devices, one's a virtual router, the one's another is a physical switch, understand that you have to do routers together, you have to do switches together. So I'm going to have to do this in two phases. So if I come over here, if I try to do them both, it'll tell me that they don't match their different families, and it's going to throw me out, and um, ask, I'll have to uncheck the ones that don't match. So what we'll do is I'll do routers first. I'm going to hit my actions. I'm going to go to provision, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to provision this device. It already knows where it's at, so I'm just going to hit next because I already assigned it. Next thing that's going to do is, do you have any configuration applicable that you want to assign? No. Advanced configuration, I'm not using templates, so I'm not going to override any of the behaviors or do things that the DNAT can't do through a template, which would be the equivalent of like telling the DNAT to copy and paste these configurations into this device. I'm going to go ahead and hit next. It's going to give me a summary of the configuration commands that it's going to implement. It's going to assign NTP. It's going to handle AAA. It's going to assign the DHCP servers, the domain name, the DNS configuration. All I'm going to do now is hit deploy, and I'm going to hit apply. And we're going to have to wait. Now, while we're waiting, are there any questions about what I've done thus far? I'm not trying to plow past everything, but because of the, the like I said, because of the delay in communications, um, sometimes this, this all gets kind of uh, wrapped up. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat right now. I'll answer them. And while you guys are doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and provision the edge. So I'm going to highlight the edge. I'll come down here, and what I'm going to do is I'll go to provision, and then I'm going to provision this device. Next. Next. Deploy. Let me get a sip of coffee here. All right. All right. I'm not seeing any questions come through. If you have a question, feel free to drop it at any time. And what I'm going to do next is I want to go back to that fabric. Now, under Super University, when I go to Building 1 and I take a look at these resources and I click on it, notice they're not gray anymore. In fact, they're white. That normally is indicative of the fact that they have been provisioned. Now, the moment that they've been provisioned, things happened. So let's go back before we do anything else. Let's take a look at CP Border 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to up arrow, and I'm going to go through those configuration commands again. So I want to look at AAA. Now, notice there is now a lot more AAA configuration. The DNAC did that for me. When I come over and say, what about BGP? We'll find that there's no BGP configured yet router or BGP, and we'll also see that there is no LISP configuration. In fact, uh, let me do section for that because that's quite a bit of config, but there won't be anything right now. So if I say show router LISP. Now, the good news is, is I don't have to know jack squat about LISP because the moment that I tell the DNAC to turn that, this device into a control plane node, it's going to push all of that configuration towards the 
border node or whatever device is acting as the control plane node. I'm going to double up. I'm going to make my CSR1000V a border node and a control plane node at the same time. So let's take a look at the process here. So we've got AAA configuration in place on this device, and there's AAA configuration on the 3650. So let's take a look at the options here. So now if I click on this device, it's not going to give me that warning, and it's going to give me these toggles. So as an example, you know, everybody's talking about how hard it is to create a fabric in a box. It's, it's super simple. You're going to click edge, border, and control plane, and you're done. You're going to have to provide information for the border operation. But at the end of the day, again, that's not hard. It does require some understanding of BGP. So right now, what I'm going to do is uh, this is going to be my border node, and I'm going to say make it a control plane node. Notice in this version, it doesn't ask me any questions. It just says, yes, Terry, I will make it a control plane node. Now, in future versions, in newer versions, we get some options. We can use BGP. We can use Lisp. We can use PubSub. There's all kinds of architectures as this technology has evolved, and it has evolved significantly. I mean, we're working with the equivalent of, you know, stone knives and bear skins right now as it relates to these resources. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say I want to make it a border node. Now, bear in mind, the compatibility matrix, when you look up, CSR1000V says it cannot be a border node. And that is true for versions below Amsterdam. I've not been able to do this in anything less than 17.3 which is referred to as the, Am the Amsterdam version of the iOS, the iOS XE operating system. It works in EVE, it works in CML, and it works inside of just running it as a OVA in ESXi like I'm doing. And what I want to do is I'm going to configure the Layer 3 handoff. Now, the Layer 3 handoff that I'm going to implement is going to be using an autonomous number of, of 65001. So I basically say, okay, the DNAC is going to configure BGP for me, and I'm going to tell the DNAC what autonomous system to use. Now, the other thing that I'm also going to do here is I can select a pool of addresses. I'm not going to worry about that right now. I just want to see it do the implementation for me. Another thing that a lot of people also don't, aren't aware of is that I can do a Layer 2 handoff I can't do it in concert with a layer three handoff, but it, with a layer two handoff, that would be for like for migration. So I'd build an 802.1Q trunk out to my old environment, and then I would enable whatever VLANs I wanted on that trunk, and then I could move workload out of my legacy environment into my new SDA managed environment. And if something went wrong, I could move it back. Cisco only supports layer two handoffs in short periods of time for the purposes of that migration that we were describing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and say add. All I did was told it I wanted it to create BGP and use an autonomous system of 65001. Now, I also said make it a control plane node. If I wanted to build a fabric in a box, I would just check edge node. But the, I know this device can't do all three of those roles, so I'm not going to worry about it. But that's the difference between making this a FIAB. People want to spend $2,000 so they can make an FIB or more because the prices keep going up for a 9300 on eBay. And it makes zero sense for, with, for the same amount of money. You could buy four 3850s and do whatever the hell you want except FIB. So my recommendation is don't worry about the 9300s. Yes, it's going to be the switch that you would have in the lab. But at the end of the day, you know, two grand just so that I could click this third button on one device just makes no sense to me, especially when I, for 200 bucks I could pick up a 3650 and do the, uh, the environment where I would actually have a, an overlay. It's just that the overlay is running between two devices. An FIAB is just a fabric of one switch. So VXLAN is still enabled, but it just doesn't really go anywhere. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and add this. Then notice it's going to say, well, CB, control plane, border, node. Now, um, when we take a look at uh, branch edge one, I'm going to go ahead and click on it, and I'm going to say make it an edge. Now, uh, when I hit add, it's going to say make it an edge node. I'm going to go ahead and start this, and I'm going to ha handle any of the questions that are coming into the chat right now. So I'm going to click save. I'm going to click apply. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this thing do its thing. So right now... Um, 
Thomas is asking, oh, it's a it's a pretty long one. Are are, are these zero day templates you built that are being sent to discovered devices? No. These are built into the DNA center. So when I tell the DNA center, I want this to be a border node, the DNA center knows exactly what configurations to apply. And since the DNA center knows about all of the devices that are working in a single fabric site, it knows to make all of those configurations compatible, and it handles all of that for me. Now, that is works 99.9% .9 of the time. I have in some production environments found scenarios and situations where I've had problems with that. So what I typically do in those situations, you're faced with two choices. One, don't use the DNAC to manage it and just manage that device individually, which is, in my opinion, an absolute catastrophe waiting to happen. Because what ends up happening is, is that we are operating in DNA Center with, an, with a networking or infrastructure as code architecture. So if the DNAC doesn't know about it and you make a change to it, troubleshooting it is an absolute nightmare. So my suggestion is that for in situations like that, let the DNAC manage it and then do your one-off in a template in the DNA center so that the DNA center has a record of what you did. So when that switch burns down and you get an RMA and you plug it in, your change propagates instead of somebody applying the template or applying the role-based behavior and it not working because you did not template the modification that you made. And that might have been you left the company a year ago and nobody knows what you did. So... That, that, you know, that's my advice, and that's why we have templates inside of the DNA Center. Now, you'll notice right now all of these devices have turned um, blue, solid blue. Now, that tells me that they are done. However, I don't trust DNAC. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the device. I'm going to go to the Details option, and from the Details option, what I'm going to do is I want to scroll down and see Success. All right, that tells me that everything is done. I'm going to go down to this branch edge. I'm going to go to the, do the same thing. A lot of times this will say configuring. Bear in mind, 3650s are slower than Christmas. All right, Christmas will come before a 3650 finishes its config. But again, belts and suspenders. Uh, before I do anything, before I go anywhere else, I make sure this says success on all of these devices. I have had these things turn blue. Everything looks copacetic. You go back and start working. You realize something's not working. You come back and take a look at this, and there's a red X on this device. And that tells you that the configuration did not take. For whatever reason, something failed in the deployment. Nine times out of ten, that's indicative of the fact that the device had touched the network before understands or remembers something about it, and it's trying to reinstantiate that as part of its onboarding mechanism. And that's not necessarily something that you're going to want to allow or have happen. So what we've got now is, is these devices are now working as control plane nodes, border nodes. We should have BGP. We should have LISP on the config. Let's take a look. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to get back into my CSR1000V, and I'm going to say show run section BGP. It'll have BGP. It'll only have the basics for it, but it does indeed have the config set up on it. Now, what we'll see here is notice that I, and this is because I've already done some pre-configuration. This is not a tutorial walkthrough on exactly how to build a DNAC from day zero. I have classes for that. And this is going to talk about what's necessary and what's going to be required in order to be able to implement our environments. Now, where did these addresses come from? Well, these addresses actually exist inside of the DNA Center. And before Thomas asks, because Thomas is asking brilliant questions, I did that. So if I go to host onboarding and under host onboarding, I go to, I'm sorry, uh, uh, let's see, I scroll uh, down. You'll notice here, I added virtual networks. I have campus and guest and IoT. And if I click on these, I assign those pools that I set up.
So again, all I did is I had pre-staged this so that we wouldn't use three hours to go through because I'm trying to make these last about an hour. Last time it was a little bit longer. I don't care if they go longer, but I know it's, it's a Saturday and a lot of people don't want to sit here and listen to me babble about things. So we can understand those were, that's where those addresses came from. And also for every one of these virtual networks, the DNA Center creates a VRF. So if we take a look at that again from the perspective of the border node, we've got it created a VRF of campus. It created a VRF of guest. It created a VRF of IOT. If I had a wireless environment, I would have one called infra. That is a default VN that exists inside the system. But again, because this is enterprise infrastructure, we don't worry about wireless, which I think is a damn shame because I don't know of a single deployment in the real world where they don't run wireless and nine times out of ten, the wireless pre-exists in concert with your ICE before you bought a DNAC. So I really don't think Cisco's doing anybody any favors by not having it on the exam. Yes, I realize that there is a wireless CCIE, but at the same time, we play around with BGP and DMVPN and MPLS and Layer 3 VPNs in enterprise infrastructure, but the service provider exists as far as a CCIE. So again, I don't think Cisco's doing us any pro any favors, but you know, if you're taking the exam, it's just one less thing that you got to worry about. Now, these IP addresses were actually assigned in my config, but what's missing? So uh, let's take a look at the BGP, the standard BGP config here. So again, I'll just up arrow this and I'm gonna stop. And notice here it says, with our configs, notice I have network commands, but I have no neighbor commands. So the DNAC half configured it. Why did it half configure it? Well, I only gave it half the information. I didn't tell it about the device that it's going to be connecting to. Now, inside of DNA Center, we have to be very, very careful because the thing is, is the DNAC does a bunch of stuff for us. So as an example, I made a border node and I made an edge node. The DNAC applied configuration to both of those devices. Let's take a look at the Lisp config. So I'll return back to this. I'm just going to say show run. I don't want to forget to look at the Lisp. Show run pipe, I'll say section, router, locator, ID, separation protocol. And what we're going to see here is, is it did install Lisp as a routing protocol. So in other words... The, this is a Lisp server, a.k.a. a control plane node. Now, it was mentioned earlier that I forgot the command for mapping on the CP border, or we didn't see those commands, but that these are the commands. It's handled by the DNAC for me. I don't have to worry about it. All I got to do is hit a little blue toggle button that says, turn this puppy into a control plane node. This is why it drives me crazy that people get so wrapped around the axles when it comes to studying for something like the Enterprise Infrastructure Exam about DNA Center. You're dropping, when you build a DNA Center environment, you know, in the early days, you know, it was like 10K just to build a DNA Center because we didn't have enough information to virtualize it. And at the end of the day, it's a point and click endeavor. You're not doing anything. You're saying, make it a control plane node. I didn't have to know jack squat about BGP other than what autonomous systems were. But the other thing that we also have to have to keep in mind here is, is that the DNAC can only configure and work with, and I'm going to return to my all fabrics. So I'll go back to Super University. I'm going to go to building one. Bear in mind that the DNAC can only control devices that are blue. Because those are devices that I've assigned roles. If I don't assign a role to a device, the DNAC can't control it. It can monitor it. The network data platform, Assurance, will work perfectly fine, but it can't do configuration commands. It can't enable BGP, do Layer 3 handoff, do Layer 2 handoff. It can't build VXLAN tunnels. It can't leverage SGTs. Well, technically it can leverage SGTs. We just have to do it manually. But the point, the perspective... What I'm trying to describe here is going to be the fact that if it ain't blue, the DNAC can't control it. Now, in the real world, you know, I might have 50 devices between this border node and this edge node. Why? Because they exist in the underlay and I want the DNAC to perceive them. But really and truly what I'm doing is I'm taking with a DNA center by building an SDA fabric and extending an overlay VXLAN architecture across that underlay. What I'm really doing is I'm reducing the subset of overall devices that I have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. So as long as I have adequate quality of service, adequate packet delivery, adequate bandwidth, adequate monitoring in the underlay, really and truly I can ignore the underlay and focus on the devices that are going to be touching 
the resources that are going to be attached to my fabric and to the resources that are beyond my fabric. Border nodes are going to be devices and resources that communicate to resources beyond my fabric. So outside of any blue cloud that I build. Edge devices are going to be connected to my classic Ethernet infrastructure, whether that's going to be CUCM, whether it's going to be 802.1Q trunks, whether it's going to be um, endpoints, servers, routers, it really doesn't matter. That's where we attach those to those edges and to those resources. And if I had more than one edge, those edges would talk to each other by extending a VXLAN tunnel between themselves. And that VXLAN tunnel would be managed, monitored, and controlled from the perspective of the DNAC. I don't have to worry about things like programmable VXLAN fabric using NSO or manual configurations, setting these things up and using other resources, whether it's Python or Ansible, to manually build all of these tunnels. So in the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure exam, all of your VXLANs are going to end up being dynamically built by the DNAC. You just need to understand how. You need to understand why. And if you can use this, you can do it. It's not hard. People that are trying to make it hard are trying to make a buck. There's hard stuff on the exam. For real, don't let people drag you down a blind alley making you believe something is going to be very, very difficult. You know, a perfect example for me, when I was studying for my routing and switching exam, I was absolutely freaking terrified by quality of service. Why? Peter Lubhukov. He's brilliant. He understands everything there is to know about quality of service. I mean, he has a PhD in mathematics, I think, at least a master's. And he would just start, and I'm like, I don't understand half of what he's writing on the whiteboard. I mean, it, it does, and it terrified me. And at no time did I ever take a lab where I had to understand any super complex component about quality of service. Redistribution, that's the other one that scared the bejesus out of me. Because every lab that anybody did, Narbic included, he had he had that ladder where you had a bunch of devices that were, you know, three dev devices and they were three links. And it built kind of like a, the rungs on a ladder you would walk up. And it was a redistribution nightmare. You couldn't scratch your butt without making a routing loop. But in the real lab, simple redistribution, a route tag, you can fix any problem that you want to be able to implement. DNA Center in the context of the enterprise infrastructure exam, is by far the same thing. A lot of people are making it a massive issue, a massive point of concern. Now, where in the SD infra section of the blueprint do you really need to put the lion's share of your effort? SD-WAN. Why? Cisco's not stupid. They know everybody can emulate it. And as a direct result of that, that means they can ask more complex questions, which is why my first live session was about policy and route leaking. And a future session is going to be about control plane policies. And then another one, I want to do one on data policies, both local and centralized inside of SD-WAN. But right now we're talking about layer three. And I've been talking for almost an hour. I apologize for that. And I haven't built it completely yet. So what's missing? Well, the problem is, is that remember everything that blew, the DNAC is going to do for me. So the SDA is what the DNAC built and only what the DNAC built. But in the lab exam, we have V edges and those V edges are independent of the DNAC. The DNAC can't reach out and touch those devices. The DNAC, well, in this version, it can't. The DNAC when it comes to a Viptela V-Edge device, which is what you're going to be tested on in the Enterprise Infrastructure Lab, is not able to control that device. In fact, that device doesn't run CDP or LLDP. So you can't even find that doggone thing. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to curse. But you can't locate it. It can't show up in this drawing, even if it, as a gray object, because the system can't detect it. We use CDP to find these devices. So as an example, for this little link to appear here between my V-Edge and, I'm sorry, between my CSR1000V running in my hypervisor and the physical switch and that cable that's connected, that little cable is that gray cable that's hooked up to Ethernet 1 now, Ethernet 1 slash 1. You have to enable CDP on the switch, on the VSS, the VMware standard switch, inside of your SXI host, or this wire doesn't appear. But at least the device shows up because we can find it. Now, when it really boils down to implementation and configuration, what we've got here is two problems. Like I said, we have two sets of controllers. In the SD-WAN, using SD-WAN as transit, we have the vManage in concert with the vBonds and the vSmarts to do their job. In the context of SDA, we have the DNAC 
which manages these devices that are going to be blue. And in your lab, you'll have one site that's an FIAB, and you'll have another site that's going to have either two borders and one edge or one border and two edges. Um, and again, that's just based on things that the students have asked me questions about. So when we really look at what's going on in this construct, understand that the BGP configuration and the neighbor configurations are all going to be applied by the DNAC. But the problem is, is the IP addresses that I define in the DNAC are unknown in the context of the vManage. So we have two points of management. Now, in newer versions of the DNA Center, you can integrate your vManage and your DNA Center. In fact, if uh, uh, this is not in the lab, but if, if we were to go back to um, the system settings and I go to settings, one of the things that I could do is I could scroll down and notice I could enter vManage properties. I could right now in version 1.3.1.7, I can give it the log information, the identity, the organizational name and everything. So when I create a virtual network, Inside of the DNA center, the DNA center communicates to the vManage and creates a VPN. And my mapping of VN to VPN is dynamic at that point. However, in the context of the Enterprise Infrastructure Lab, Cisco doesn't use this. In this version of the code, it's not reliable in the least. In the newer versions, it works absolutely fantastic. In the newer versions, when I build a multi-domain where I have SDA controlling a sub-architecture of catalyst devices and I have an ACI controlling a sub-architecture of data center-based Nexus devices and I have SD-WAN between them, I, I integrate the DNAC to the v, to the the I the sorry I integrate the DNAC to the vManage. I integrate the DNAC to the APIC. And everything's hunky-dory and fine. So for every virtual network I build, I get an endpoint group inside of the APIC, communications, exchange back and forth, monitoring, ICE, all of it works together. In this version, not so much. So again, just understand that it does exist. But I promised you guys that what we were going to do is we were going to build this Layer 3 handoff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the fabric. I'm going to go back to Super University, and I want to talk about what's missing. Because the thing that we need to understand here is, is that when I click on this border node, I want to change the config. So I'm going to select configure. I'm going to click it. And from the configuration, I need to tell it how it's going to be communicating to the outside world. Now, bear in mind, before I do this, again, let's take a look at the branch one. So it's going to be net admin. Ice is cool. If I didn't fat finger it, which I probably did. Yep. Net admin. Ice is cool. Enable. And again, it's ice is, ice is cool. And I'm going to say show IP interface brief. And what we're going to see is notice that there is no IP address assigned to gigabit three. In fact, it's administratively down. So... When we look at what's going on here, there are some things that we need to, to pay attention to because that is the link that points to my vEdge. Now, again, in the labs, show CDP neighbor, show LLDP neighbor is not going to work. You got to take the drawing at face value because vEdges don't run LLDP and they don't run CDP. Whoever came up with that idea should have been punched in the throat, but they did. So now what I want to do is I want to now tell the DNA center about the resource that it needs to connect to that it can't control. Where do I do that? Well, I create something called a peer transit network in the context of the DNA C. It's already been done. I'll log into mine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel out of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to all fabrics. And we'll see there's two types of fabrics. There's the fabric, which is an overlay fabric. So devices that are going to be communicating to each other inside of a fabric site will all exist inside of a fabric. And if I have sub-fabrics, what we call distributed fabrics, so this, this site right here could be in Mumbai. Another site could be, say, for instance, in Sydney, Australia, and I could use SD-WAN to connect the two. But the problem is, is DNAC doesn't know jack squat about SD-WAN. SD-WAN right now doesn't know jack squat about the DNA center or the SDA environments, much less the individual fabric sites and the IP addresses that are going to be running on them. 
So what we want slash need to do is we need to come up with a way of being able to quantify the resources that the DNA and the SDA fabric are going to be communicating to that the DNAT can't control. Let's talk about how to do that. So we do that by creating what is referred to as a peer trans fabric or a transit slash peer network. Transit network is going to be to communicate between sites. And a peer network might be where, let's say, I have a direct connection on a border node to my internal data center. So I've got, you know, like a thousand routes in my data center, and I want those to be reachable via hosts connected to my edge devices. That's why I would create a peer network. But functionally, there's absolutely no difference between them. The only protocol that I can run is BGP. It can be eBGP, it can be IBGP, but BGP is the only protocol that I can run, irregardless of whatever type I'm, I'm running here. So if I take a look at Building One Transit, all I did was I said I created it. It is a, an IP-based transit. If I have an SD access transit, that's using something called a TCP, a transit control plane node. Think of a transit control plane node as a control plane node, a super node that exists outside of all of my fabrics, but all of my internal control plane nodes communicate to it. So it's a point of LISP routing distribution. The drawback, it looks fantastic on paper, but the drawback is going to be the fact that it takes something like less than, um, I would never deploy it if I had more than 75 milliseconds uh, smooth round trip time. So anything less than that, I wouldn't even consider it. Um, oh, well, actually, we rephrase that. Uh, less than 120 is, is what I would do. Cisco says somewhere in the, in, the, in the 90 range. But, you know, 150. Because if it loses, if it loses synchronization, if there's problems, it can be problematic for our environment. But all this guy does is describe the outside world, IP based. Well, we're going to be IP based, running BGP, running in vManage in the lab. That's what we're going to do. What is the autonomous system number I'm going to communicate to? I define it here. It could be six five zero zero zero, and be an IBGP peer, or it can be six five zero zero one and be an EBGP peer. I'm using EBGP because that's what I do a lot most of the time in production environments. What about my optional routing protocols? BGP, that's the only protocol I can run on any on any border node connecting to another autonomous system. All right, so as a direct result of that, what I want to do is I'm going to use this. Well, how do I use it? Well, I need to get back into my border node, and I need to inform my border node about the existence of that transit network. I'm going to go ahead and hit configure, and I'm going to say I want you to use a transit network – the transit network that I'm going to want to use is going to be this guy right here. And I'm going to say default to all virtual networks. I could check that off, but the, you'll notice here the problem is, is that everything's kind of grayed out. Well, what I've got to do is I've got to select an IP pool to be used. Now, I didn't do it in class. I didn't do, excuse me. I didn't do it in this live session, but I created a specialized pool called Layer 3 Handoff. And it is going to be 100.1.103.0 slash 24. And the system is going to carve off a, a group of slash 30 subnets and assign them to the interfaces that we're going to be using to communicate to the outside world. The DNAC is going to do this for me. So if I, again, take a look at the control plane border node, and we see here on Gigabit Ethernet 3, I have no interfaces, no IP addresses assigned. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to fix that. So to fix that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this guy right here. I am going to add this to my infrastructure. I am going to go to build my transit node. So in other words, I need to find an, an interface that's going to be connected to it. So I'm going to hit add the interface. It's going to be an external interface, gigabit 3. And... I can tell it what virtual networks I want it to run. I'm going to do campus, guest, and IoT. That's it, guys. Save. All right. So I'm, I'm running four virtual networks across Gigabit Ethernet 3. The four virtual networks that I'm running somehow. Notice it grabs default on its own. If I uncheck it and I say save, still says four. So default is default. So it's, that's the global routing construct. So what I'm going to do now is all I'm going to do is I'm going to say add. Add. 
Uh, also, one of the things in this version, if the if the icon you click and it doesn't work, you m jiggle your mouse around until it turns tar a, a darker color, and then then it will actually take. Again, that doesn't happen as commonly in the newer versions. And let's see if this actually goes in and does my config for me. Now, when I assign the virtual networks, the system knows that it needs to use VLANs because the link that's going from here up to what we're seeing as the internet is actually an 802.1 Q trunk. Since this is a CSR, we're going to use subinterfaces, encapsulation driven subinterfaces. If this was a 9300, it would be an 802.1 Q trunk, and then we would use SVI interfaces for those VLANs. Now, the first time you do this, it's going to use, in this version, it's going to use 3001, 3002, and 3003. Uh, if you do it again, it will iterate those. So those, those, th those will not always be the same, which is, again, a problem because in this version, if you make a modification or change, not only could you fix what wasn't working, you could accidentally break something that was. So again, when we go in and we start looking at what's going on in this environment, what I want to do now is see exactly what happened. So first, before I do anything and waste any time, I'm going to click, I'm going to go to details, and I want to see success, not configuring, or failed. Failed is a thing, unfortunately. And what I want to do now is I'm going to repeat my show IP interface brief. And what we're going to notice is, is that it created those sub interfaces. And as a direct result of what's going on here, we've got the 100.1.103.1, 100.1.103.5, 100.103.9. And we see here that we are still, quote unquote, administratively down. Now, administratively down. I mean, obviously, if I come in here and say config T interface gigabit three, and I do a no shut, and we go to interface gigabit 3.301, no same thing, no shut. I'm just going to do them all. Two, no shut. This should have been turned on from the beginning. And let's see, show, IP, interface, brief, E, assigned addresses. And now we see that those addresses, 100.1.103.1.5 and .9, and if I look at those, show, run, interface, gigabit, 3, 301, the DNAC did all of this for me. So my encapsulation, .1Q, 3001, was done by the DNAC for me. The RF forwarding for campus was done by the DNAC for me. The assignment of the IP addresses is a slash 30 was done by the DNAC for me. The configuration of the show, run, pipe, section BGP. Now I'm going to have neighbor statements that are going to the different areas. So not only did the DNA center apply the IP addresses, the DNA center used a slash 30, which means there's only one other option of an address that I can use on the other end. And as a direct result of that, I now know what IP addresses I have to assign in the vManage in order to be able to get the peering relationship up and operational between these resources. And students immediately say, well, what if I say show IP BGP summary? There's no BGP summary. Well, Terry, it's not even trying. That's not true. If I say show IP BGP, I'm sorry, show IP BGP all summary, and we take a look at what's going on. Notice I see things now, but what I want you to see here is, is that these are showing up as VPN V4 address families. In other words, I've got route distinguishers. Show, run, VRF. And let's take a look at the VRF. And you're going to notice that the, the VRF assigned import, export targets, route distribution. It assigned route distinguishers. And these are all based on values that are associated to these prefixes that exist inside of the Lisp routing protocol. The Lisp routing protocol is the control plane for the overlay. When I want to do a MAC address or an IP address lookup, I'm going to query the Lisp database. The Lisp database is going to come back, and it's going to give me a destination IP, which will be my destination TEP address for the origination of my source and destination VXLAN tunnel. And again, all of this takes place underwater. 
There's nothing. I mean, if it don't work, you undo it and you do it again. There's no real troubleshooting that goes into this. And when I have in production environments, when I have run into situations where there are problems, it's in newer versions of the code working with older versions of iOS XE. And the answer nine times out of 10 is to upgrade the older devices. I have run into some scenarios where I don't have that capability, uh, aka being able to go in and upgrade those devices. Uh, because of the simple fact that it might stop supporting something or it might institute to a change. And that's when I end up having to figure out how to fix the problem because I'm a subject matter expert, we're routing and switching in data center CCIE, and I've been taught how to do the troubleshooting. And once I find out what the problem is, I can normally correct that through the instantiation and deployment of DNA center templates. So what we've just done right now is we have spent, unfortunately, an entire hour, and I apologize for that, going through and demonstrating everything that the DNAC is going to do for us. But the problem is the DNAC might be doing this for us, but the DNAC can't help us with the V-Edge. The V-Edge in the context of the Enterprise Infrastructure Lab is what we call a fusion node in the context of the DNA or the SDA architecture. A fusion node is going to be that point where traffic is going to be made reachable without VXLAN tunnels. So if I have, as an example, if I go back into my DNA center here and I go back to my fabric and I go back to Super U, what I'm going to see now is, is the DNAC knows about the fabric. The DNAC knows about the transit, but the DNAC can't control the fabric, the, the transit. I have to log into that device from the perspective of the V edge and make the appropriate configuration such that I can build these adjacencies. Now, if I were to create another fabric, so if I come over here and say I want to create another fabric, I'll come over here and say building two. I'm going to create another fabric. And I'm just going to allow these VNs in that fabric. Normally, I'd have building one campus, building one guest, whatever. But what we're going to see now is I now actually have two fabrics. Communication from this fabric to this fabric is only going to be allowed to transit whatever transit fabric I have built. So as an example, I have clients right now that have a BGP transit fabric, and then they run... Um, segment routing between these devices, or they run VXLANs using NSX. Sorry, they use uh, VXLAN, not NSX, but um, using Nexus. Uh, I have clients that are using SD-WAN. So as an example, this transit node right here might be, say, a V-Edge or a C-Edge located in Herndon, and this guy would be connected to a device uh, that might be a C-Edge or a V-Edge located in India, and then we would have an SD-WAN that would run between them. That's the context of the lab. But that traffic that's going to be traveling inside Building 1 to any resource in Building 1 is VXLAN. Anything in Building 2 that's traveling to a device inside of Building 2 will be inside of a VXLAN tunnel. But traffic traveling between Building 1 and Building 2 will be IP transit. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to be popping our VXLAN header off. And the VXLAN header is where we maintain information about the virtual network. It's where we keep the information about the SGTs. So if I want micro-segmentation micro between multiple sites, I have to have a solution that's going to allow me to be able to provide that. And that would be an instance where I would use an, SD an SDA transit with a, con a transit control plane node, or I could run LISP inside of SD-WAN in the newer versions of the vManage software. Uh, as it is right now uh, in, in SD Geeks. Uh, which is which is my training site. I'm going to be upgrading all of my training to um, 20.9.1 uh, because 20.9.1 introduces a whole number of new features and capabilities to include what is referred to what used to be called hierarchical SD architecture is now called multi-region SD WAN fabric, and 20.9.1 uh, is the first to support it. So I I am going to be upgrading all of my all of my SD-WAN classes to 20.9.1 that are not specific to the CCIE lab because the CCIE lab uh, for enterprise infrastructure uses 18.4.4. 
uh, or 18.4.x. I'm using 18.4.4 because it's the most stable. So, but again, we've created all of these infrastructures. Now, when it comes to the other part of the equation, devices that exist in my SDA are going to send all traffic that's not in the SDA fabric to the border node and allow the border node to send it to the outside world. And the border node is going to be trying to run BGP to external devices. So again, if I come over here and I say show run section BGP, we'll see here that when it comes to campus, campus is trying to form a neighbor relationship with a device that has the IP address of 100.1.103.2. It's running .1. And it's an autonomous system, 65001. And we can see here that I'm actually sourcing it from Gigabit Ethernet 3.1, uh, 3001. Uh, no, uh, William, I'm sorry. Just to make that clear, William's asking, and uh, he got his answer, but so everybody knows. The CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Exam is, is 18.4.x. Uh, I actually think it is 18.4.4. Uh, every student I've asked to double check for me, when they come back, it's like, oh, I forgot. And I'm like, well, I can't blame them for forgetting, you know. You're taking a CCIE exam, you know, satisfying my curiosity is not going to be exactly at the top of your, um, your interest. So I want to do one connection to the outside world because I want to talk about what we would do to implement this in our infrastructure. And in order to be able to do that, I need to log into admin my Eve environment. Because right now, this border, this node right here, this vEdge 13 node is the node that I'm using to connect to that resource. And when we do this, what we have to do, since we are not integrating the vManage and the DNA center in the context of the lab, I would never do that in a production environment. I would never leave them decoupled. But in, a, in the lab, obviously, it's not a real-world exam. Um, what would end up happening is we would have to make a decision. In fact, if you look at your blueprint in the enterprise infrastructure, there is a section that's referred to as VN to VPN static mapping. Well, that's just a decision. It's not a task. So all I'm going to say is, is okay, in SD-WAN, I'm going to use VPN 100 for the virtual network of campus. My IoT, I could use VPN 198 or some other number, anything between 1 and 511. So that's a decision. It's not a task. It's not an implementation. It's not a technology. Now, if they were bound together, the system would dynamically do it for me, and I'd have to find out or know or tell it which one to use at the time that I created the VN. So. Don't worry. I'm not going to run us over uh, much more. Uh, I, what I wanted to do, and again, this is testing whether or not that cable is actually working, is I want to take a look at show run VPN 100. Now, VPN 100, I want to map to campus. And as such... What I need to do is I need to get Gigabit Ethernet 2 into VPN 100, but I need to use encapsulation. I need to use 802.1Q support. In order to be able to do that in a V-Edge or in a C-Edge, I must run sub-interfaces. So let's talk about some of the problems that we can run into. Now, I'm going to tell you now it's not going to work, but don't wig out because you know, I, I'm expecting it not to work. Now, as a direct result of that, we will obviously make it work. So what I want to do, first of all, is I want to configure one interface. Now, the interface that I'm going to configure is going to be Campus, which is going to be VPN 100. And I am going to need to give it an IP address of 100.1.103.2 slash 30. So let's take a look at what I need to do to do that. So I'm going to say config T and I'm going to go to VPN 100. I'm not using templates. I try to teach everybody how to do everything at the command line that can be done easily at the command line before I add the complexity of using templates. Now, once you understand how a template works, you're never going to go back to the command line. But when you're trying to understand how the vManage and the vEdges work, majority of us as network engineers know the command line. 
The other thing about this is, is going to be I'm just simply taking away one level of complication. Let's understand how it works, and then we'll make it work using templates. And then, like I said, you'll probably never go back. But the other thing that's also part of this is going to be the fact that <clears throat> when we handle these implementations, the command line syntax in AV Edge is different than anything we've ever worked with. Becoming familiar with it is going to be useful for you, whether you're doing this in the real world or you're doing this in labs. Now, the majority of my clients that are using the edges still today are in the process of migrating away from V edges. They're going to Catalyst 8Ks, Catalyst 8KVs, or they're um, using CSR 1000 Vs or ISRs. In the lab, the only thing that you need to know is a V edge. And my recommendation is, is if that's all you freaking need to know, you need to know it inside and out. When you do something in a template, the template does exactly what the DNAC does. It pushes configuration to these devices. It pushes the configuration that you tell it to push. Sometimes it's hard to troubleshoot a template because they're scattered, especially if it's a feature template. 99.9% .9 of the time, I log into the command line, look at what was pushed, find out where the mistake was made there, and then backtrack to the feature template or the template modification or the data assigned to a template during the association to fix it easily. So again, I'm not trying to make you guys think that you need to understand how to do this at the command line. I'm just trying to mitigate the level and the degree of complication. So... All I'm going to do now inside of here is I'm going to say I want to assign gigabit Ethernet 0 to, and I'm going to give it 3001. Remember, that's going to be the interface. So, yeah, uh, the source interface is going to be gigabit Ethernet 30, I'm sorry, 3.3.001. Um, so, let's see here. So, I'm going to go ahead and assign this. Now, it's not going to work. Well, let's take a look. Let's go ahead and say, well, Terry, you say it won't work. Let's go ahead and assign it. Well, notice it's going to say aborted parent interface gigabit Ethernet 02 for tagged interface gigabit Ethernet 231 does not exist in VPN 0. Well, let's do a show interface description. And let's see, do I see gigabit Ethernet 2? Yes, I do. And notice it says it's in VPN 0. It's down, down, but it says it's in VPN zero. Well, let's modify this. Let's go into VPN zero. I'm going to say interface gigabit zero two. I'm going to go ahead and say no shut. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit commit. It's still not going to work, but let's hit commit. Now notice it says here, the VPN interface of gigabit ethernet zero two, the MTU is wrong. Remember, we're adding an 802.1 Q encapsulation. Think back to your CCNA days. That's four bytes of information that's going to be added. And right now, if we take a look at what's going on, this interface is running at 1500 MTU. So I need to arbitrarily change the size of the MTU by at least four on this sub-interface to make room for the 802.1 Q encapsulation. But it is not very intuitive with regard to the, the recommendation it's making. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back into VPN 100. I'm going to go to Gigabit Ethernet 02.3001, and I'm going to say my MTU is going to be 1496. I usually use 1437, but in this instance, I'm going to go ahead and do 96. So that's four less. So if I come over here and I say commit, it should take the command. Now, at this particular juncture, if I do a do show interface description to see the interface is, now when we look at it, notice that I have VP, I have 100. Right now it's showing us down, down. I didn't turn it on. And it also doesn't have an IP address. Well, I said it had to have an IP address. So let's go ahead and make that change. So I'm still under interface gigabit ethernet 02.3001. I'm going to say IP address. 100.1.103.2 slash 30. No shut. Commit and quit this time. Now let's do a show IP interface. I'm sorry. Show interface description. 
As soon as I start typing on the CLI, I think I'm on a, on a Cisco router. Now, notice what we've got here. We've got Gigabit Ethernet 2, 301, says it is currently up. Let's see. Can I ping 100.1.103.1, and I want to source it from – actually, uh, we'll do VPN, sorry. VPN 100. Now, I'm hoping this is going to work, but bear in mind, uh, at the last minute, I ran a cable to the data center, so I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to get IP reachability. And right now, I'm not seeing anything there. So, and again, that could be half a dozen reasons. Uh, we got 100% packet loss. Let's see what's going on. So, I'm not going to drag you guys through a troubleshooting ordeal. I just want to make certain, first of all, that I'm mapped to the right group. So, SDA connections connected. So, that's right. Then I need to... Um, three. So, that's good. Let me check the CP border node, make sure I did that right. So I'll say admin, not net admin, sorry. Go IP, I'm sorry. Ice is cool, show. IP interface brief, E assigned addresses. All right. So one hundred one one oh three two in sub. Sorry, it's VRF. VRF first in these. So, nope. Just want to make sure that I didn't fat finger anything. So, slash 30. Show run interface. 3, It probably plugged into the wrong port on the server in the data center, but a two two dot one three. So edit. So that should have been on Ethernet three zero one three. All right, well, like I said, I'm not going to drag you guys through a troubleshooting. What I'll do is I'll fix it, and I'll record a video, and I'll make that available. But like I said, the problem that we're going to run into is the fact that the DNAC can't control the V-Edge. Now, if something were to change, say, for instance, in the DNA center, if I made a modification and the VLAN changed, which is entirely possible. So as an example, if we take a look at um, – if I go into the DNA center and from the perspective of the DNA center, I want to go to um, my fabric. I'm going to go to host onboarding, and <clears> – <throat> When I add my – well, I don't have any networks to add. I'd have to add another one. But the point is is that when I create these virtual networks, I, the DNAC assigns the um, VLAN. Now, in newer versions, I assign the VLAN, so they become, they become constant. But the problem is, is since it's dynamically a st starting at 3001, 3002, 3003, the next one would be 3004 if I had one. And I didn't create, uh, create a third one, and I, I'm not going to go through that uh, part of the scenario. But uh, again, just bear in mind that uh, these connections are going to be the way that we're going to get to the outside world. And right now, it seems like my cable is not cutting the mustard. So either I plugged it up into the wrong port or somebody's unplugged it. I, don't, I doubt very seriously it's been unplugged because I warned everybody under pain of death. So IP address inside of that VRF is not working from here, and that's gigabit 3. It's so hard for me not to troubleshoot stuff. It is connected. 
and from this guy right here. Uh, one thing that I could do real quick is let me add a an IOL device here. So a layer two. We'll just make it a switch. I just want to see if CDP will run. That'll give me a chance to check my my link. Crazy, Terry. Come on. All right. So if I grab this and just plug it into that port right here and turn that on. We'll check it out. All right, so while I'm doing this, again, I'm just doing some troubleshooting uh, on this. I'm going to say config t, Ian, config t, host name, r23, interface, ethernet 00, zero no shut, exit, show CDP, neighbors. All right, don't have anything yet. So has this been helpful for you guys up to this point? Because what I'll probably do is I'll continue the rest of this as uh, some additional videos that you guys can just walk on your own. So, Oh, just as a check real quick here, show CDP neighbors. So... I see the ice out that connection. That's all out of one. I'm not seeing anything out of three. Is that same data center room you built recently in your backyard, or is the, uh, it's it's in my backyard, brother? <laughs> I just recently, uh, if I get into the SD Geeks site, uh, let me. Yeah. I mean, the the polycarbonate walls aren't here yet. I, I've ordered uh, polycarbonate walls uh, that are foil lined uh, that are going to go in. But yeah, this is the this is the data center equipment. The uh, the um, the SDA equipment's on the other side. I have a, a total of like thirty two um, uh, catalyst devices and uh, a number of DNACs now. I actually have three DNACs now. Uh, not counting the the little one that I'm experimenting with, but um, yeah, let me get out of here. All I'm I'm, I'm just trying to see it, if I can see a CDP neighbor. Then um, I've got a configuration problem. If I can't see a CDP neighbor, then um, oh Terry, sorry. Um, then I can um um. If I can see it, then I got a configuration error. If I don't see it, then I don't. I, I got to figure out what's going on. Do I have any workbooks on this, which I, you can follow step by step? Um, uh, as an example, um, all of those materials that I do. So let's go in and let's take a look at the uh, the SD WAN Zero to Hero. Right now, we're in, we're we're uh, starting next week is week two of the SD WAN Zero to Hero. But as an example, what I do, in, instead of writing my labs, uh, my labs are actually integrated into the, into the lesson plans uh, for, so there's a video walkthrough, and then there's a set of tasks that you can follow to implement it in your lab. So if, uh, as a student, you want to build my lab, I, I provide all of the files. Probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, I provide all of the files so that you can build your environment, and I give you guys walkthroughs on how to do it, theory behind how things work, and then uh, students build their environment. Uh, I owe students zero touch provisioning lab and starting Monday uh, week two releases of the the SD WAN zero to hero class and right now the only classes that I'm focused on are uh, zero to hero uh, for uh, data center which that's why the lab was being built out uh, I just did all of the early release for automation for zero to hero we're actually going to have a live workshop next week uh, probably on Saturday. And um, that this will be a five-week uh, class, 
uh, that's taught on the weekends and uh, some sessions during the weekdays. And the SDA Hero, uh, Zero to Hero, I've put a, pulled the plug on this because I'm going to uh, go ahead and deploy this as a um, as 20.9.1 uh, because I was originally doing it on 20.2.3. 20 no, I'm sorry, 20.2.3.5. .5, yeah, and they upgraded, so I'm, I'm actually going to be changing that over. So all new videos for that class. But, um, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of different things going on over there. But as far as producing lab guides, no, I do not. Um, having everything all in one location lets me um, keep track of everything and show CDP neighbors. Give me just one second here. Let me see. Uh... Yeah. So, yep, uh, I plugged the cables up wrong, so I won't be able to continue this. I'm not going to drag you guys through that. But what I want to do right now is um, I've covered what I wanted to cover. I guess I, what I'll do is I'll do a video uh, and just make a regular video and apply that. Um, do I have the uplink interface on Eve? Yes, I do. The... Um, I mean, this right here is uh, is Cloud 3. That goes to Ethernet 3. I thought that was the, the interface that I plugged into. So um, the problem was is the server that I was using for this, I wasn't able uh, to get the vManage to work, so I moved the cable over. So, yeah. I don't want to drag you guys through the troubleshooting. I mean, I appreciate any any thoughts. But when I find out what's wrong, I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let, everybody, let everybody know. But what I wanted to do was ultimately... I want to have a virtual machine attached to that 3650, and I want to get an IP address out of this uh, this DHCP server up here. So um, right now, all of these devices are getting their IP address from this DHCP server. So if I click on CSR10, Ian, and I say show... IP DHCP binding, what we're going to see is it's issuing uh, these two addresses, which are actually being assigned to this PC and this PC. And I wanted to have the third one get issued out of VPN 100. And then, um, but uh, since I, I'm having problems getting connectivity between the border node in a server in the other room and the uh, v edge running in this room, then I've got a, oh, well, I'm sorry, the SDA running in this room, I've got a uh, physical problem that I've got to try to figure out what the deal is. All right, are there any questions of me? Like I said, the delay is kind of a bear. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, go here, and if anybody has any questions. Also, um, the next session, I would like you guys to let me know what you would like to see on the next session. Uh, it can't be just a free-for-all. Um, so three topics. So um, if you want to see a video about AAR, just type AAR in the comments, application aware routing. If you want to see – if you want to have a live session on um, – Let's see. I said AAR. Oh, I'm sorry. Policy, standard policy, like, for instance, centralized control plane data policies, that kind of thing. If you want to see uh, a video about DIA, direct internet access, just go ahead and put those in the chat. That's what I'm uh, squaring, trying to square away. But Pender's asking me what's the next thing for the chat. It'll, you guys will hear it. So I want you guys to pick. So three topics. So um, AAR, centralized policies. Actually, let's say AAR, data policies, and control plane policies. Let's do those three. I think that would be one. You guys pick which one you want. Is there a flash upgrade? No. Um, the 3650, um, you will need let, – let me um, – Trying to remember what version that is. Uh, let me open my DNAC and I'll answer your question for you specifically. So if I go to uh, design image repository, uh, you will need to uh, – I'm running 16.12.0.7. So that's uh, Gibraltar, I think. Okay. 
So again, whether you're watching this now or you're watching uh, in, in the replay on YouTube, uh, the three comments. So like I said, uh, we'll, the next video will either be about application aware routing. It'll be about centralized policy. Well, I'm sorry, data policies or um, uh, control plane policies. That'll, those will be the three choices. And if you guys come up with or want something else, just let me know. Uh, I'll look at it and then I'll make a decision as far as uh, what the next live is going to be about. Uh, I do do wireless in, in, in the, uh, as far as integration to wireless, for me, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the question was, is are there any plans for wireless SDA? Um, if you're learning SDA, you've got, you need to learn wireless. Uh, I teach, um, uh, over the top, I teach embedded wireless and I teach, uh, well, I teach over the top, I teach, um, fabric enabled and then I teach embedded. Yeah, DIA back up with another site. That that's always really cool. Also, multi multi region is cool too. So I'm seeing AAR. I'm seeing <laughs> data policy. Uh, so we'll we'll, we'll wait. And set it up. I don't want to waste people's time. I want to cover topics that you guys are genuinely interested in. I think application aware routing is probably uh, the least understood of all of the policy deployments, and it's probably one of the easiest to implement. Um, data policies, uh, as an example, if I want to do route manipulation uh, with BGP or OSPF running service side, that's typically going to be a data, a data policy, and they can be localized or centralized. Uh, control plane policies are always fired against OMP. Uh, OMP is another topic that we could talk about if you guys want. But again, I, what I'll do is I'll probably wait until maybe Tuesday and take a look and see if anybody else has any suggestions. But right off the bat, I was thinking about AAR, uh, data pol policies, and um, uh, control plane policies. Oh, T-Lock extension. That's another really good one. Um, we could do a... We could do a T lock using command line and using um, templates because we can do one in uh, CP border one. Uh, we can do one in uh, branch two. That's what that. Let me sorry. Yeah, we could do we could do a T lock extension in uh, branch two site twenty. Just got just understand. I'm here to try to help you guys as best I can. Uh, a lot of people on the YouTube channel have been asking for, you know, like full-on classes. Um, and um, as far as that goes, that's why I started SD Geeks. Uh, and with regard to SD Geeks, fundamentally, it's everything I want someone to know before they take my SD infrastructure class or they take my data center infrastructure class. And there's a lot of classes that I want to teach that I can't teach. Um, that I'm going to be doing on my own. So uh, once I get data center and, and enterprise infrastructure up and running, I'm going to be adding NSXT. Uh, I'm going to be adding some VMware stuff, um, mostly focusing around things that I do in production environments. Uh, I have a mixed bag of clients. I would say 90% of my clients are VMware. Uh, however, a lot of those clients have become very, very antsy post-acquisition because they're not like major, major players. Uh, and they are looking at other solutions, and the clients that aren't running VMware are running Nutanix and, and things along those lines. So a lot of the, the guys are using um, uh, Linux. So, I mean, there's lots of different options moving forward. But the primary goal is to get the programs out there and get classes out there, and I don't want, I don't want to do a, a, a site where it's just – watch these recordings because the problem is, is, you know, I've paid for a lot of uh, training videos and training sites myself, and I probably watched three or four of the videos and, and never go back because it's just me in a dark room watching videos. So what we try to do or what I'm trying to do is I want to instantiate where you can learn as much of the basic theory on your own, and then we have live sessions and stuff like that. Uh, William, what class did you take? Liam's asking for a redo, which, yeah, I mean, if you're a previous student of mine, I have no problem. 
uh, setting things up. Um, I, I, and for you guys that don't know, I mean, I teach mostly for my chronics training. Uh, Narbic and I, we've been we've been tag teaming training for years, and uh, there's um, there's a lot of things that I want to teach that don't I can't teach under his mantle or they're not really ready for me to teach under his mantle. And there's a lot of things that I do teach for his, him. And the problem is, is like, for instance, if you take my SD, my SD, um, if you take my ACI advanced class, or if you take my SD WAN advanced class, the problem is, is that a lot of students are like, well, um, they don't know they're, they're taking an advanced class and they're in over their head the day they start. And I really got in trouble. Um, I can't remember which class it was, but uh, one student got very, very irate because I was like, well, you should have known, you should know the basics before you take an advanced class. And he was, well, where do I learn the basics? And I'm like, well, you can just, you know, go online and, and I mean, Udemy and whatever. And um, uh, then he's like, have you tried it? And then the answer to that question was no. So I actually ended up trying it. And uh, it, it wasn't as straightforward as I thought it was going to be. Uh Oh, you took an SD WAN. Oh, William. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, all right. You, yeah, uh, you've got my email. Send me an email, and I'll, I'll get you in, man. I'll get you in. Well, like I said, SD Geeks. Bipendra's asking about SD Geeks. It's it's uh, all SD Geeks is is a mighty is a mighty network uh, of people who are. You know, taking different classes and have different interests. So, in inside of that uh, that group uh, is going to be people that are doing NP, uh, they're doing CCIE level, uh, they're focused on different things. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build an environment where we're all helping each other. So it's more it's a community with a classroom environment. I'm showing the classroom, but I mean, obviously, uh, we have. Um, um, you know, different groups. The, there's a number of people that are part of it as far as, you know, E-Man's in there. He helps people with uh, jobs, uh, job opportunities, answering questions, asking questions about um, the um, – uh, sorry, asking questions about resumes and, and job placement. He's helped a couple of guys find jobs. Um, and it, it's really and truly all about, you know, pretty much anything software to find. So um, what I do here, I do when I can, as I can, and uh, where I'm doing my focus and putting my formal, all my formal new classes. So as an example, for my chronics, I teach 18.4.4 because that's what Narvik does. Narvik teaches CCIE. However, there's, a, there's you know, hundreds of people out there that want to learn software to find WAN, but they don't want to learn 18.4.4. And then learn the difference. They want to learn, you know, as close to what's currently out there now. They want to learn about umbrella integration. They want to learn about, you know, thousand eyes. They want to learn about automation and all of those things. So, you know, uh, this is my way of being able to to do that. Everybody's like, "Oh, you're leaving Narbic." I'm like, "I never leave Nar Narbic. Narbic's like my, Narbic's like my older brother um, and uh, their family." But this is this is something that I'm just doing on my own. Uh. And then uh, you're part of the Enterprise Advanced Boot Class. Uh, still need to enroll with the automation. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I recognize you, man. Believe it or not, I'm not that brain damaged yet. <clears throat> it's happening. I, I nearly killed myself trying to move the data center all by myself. Anybody here that's ever tried to list a, lift a UCSB chassis 51, uh, 5108 by yourselves, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Once I got my insides pushed back in, I was fine. Are these, uh, basically what I'm wanting to, as I, I will continue to do these sessions on Saturdays uh, because I know that there's a lot of people out there that, you know, I mean, I've been there. I didn't have the money to pay for this or pay for that, and everybody's the same. And uh, as far as being able to share information and ask questions, I mean, that's what it's all about for me. Um, when After my mom passed away, I really started sitting back and thinking about, you know, at 55 years old, you know, where am I in the grand scheme of things right now? And I'm not where I wanted to be. Um, you know, if you'd asked me 15 years ago uh, what my my paradigm was, my paradigm was ch was train the world. I wanted – that was my primary goal. I wanted to be able to teach everything that I know to anybody that wanted to know it. And 
I, I guess the caveat to that is is that you know the, in order to be able to do that, I've got to have equipment. I, in order to be able to do that, I've got to pay the electric bill. I mean, there's a lot of things, and that dream kind of became a business. And um, the one of my big issues or one of the, my problems, and I've said this, and I think I said it in the last live session, is is it's very very difficult to learn something that you can't afford to get your hands on. It's very, very difficult to learn something that's constantly changing and evolving. And, you know, the YouTube channels become my way of trying to get that out there. Um, after next, the next session, the next live session is going to be a live session like this. I'm thinking that the session after that, we might just do an actual workshop. And at that, at that point, that means, you know, we log in, we do some device discovery, we add some resources, uh, not building a full on fabric because that would be cost prohibitive. But I mean, if I can set up, you know, as, however many CSRs we need, uh, I've got enough uh, space to probably run about 50 of those. Uh, we could discover those and, and, and at least build borders and control plane nodes. I don't have enough devices to go around for edges. But I'm actually thinking about trying to figure out a way to make that work to just have a, a free-for-all uh, for SD, SDA. Another thing you also could do is dCloud. dCloud, oh, let me, sorry. I'm, uh, dCloud is um, uh, available. Uh, the problem with dCloud is, is that it's latest and greatest, and uh, if you're studying for your CCIE, it's not going to be a huge help because uh, when Cisco changes from the different versions – uh, the graphical user environment changes and everything looks different and things are in different places. So that's kind of frustrating for guys that are being forced to learn, you know, 18.4 and production is, you know, um, in, in SD-WAN, it's going to be 20.9. Uh, the system specifications to build your own DNAC is one, you got to have a server that's going to be big enough to handle it. Uh, but the DNAC that I'm running, if I go into my um, home lab, my VDNAC. I'm using I, I, 62 CPUs, 256 gigs of RAM, 600 gigs of storage, but that needs to be um, um, uh, thin provisioned. So if you've got a server... I would. I tried it in 48 because I got a. I got a ton of 48 CPU servers laying around here, and it would work one day, and then it would just stop, and I could never make it work. Uh, I even went in and shut down Docker containers and reloaded Docker containers, and uh, it, it was just so problematic. So, uh, 62 is the safest. It's the most stable. I've not. I've not run into any problems. If you run a 600 gigabyte hard drive, it needs to be solid state. Because when you install the DNAC, it's going to check the read-write speed of that drive. And if it's, if it's inadequate to the task, it won't allow you to install. The other recommendation is, is that if you are going to do it in this small of a format, 600 gigs is only enough uh, for uh, maintaining about one snapshot. So uh, bear in mind that, you know, uh, operational constraints get snapshotted. So when you take a snapshot of a machine, if you want to do a recovery, turn it off and then take your snapshot. Also, uh, disconnect your, um, uh, your um, IOSO images. Oh, I didn't know that, Adnan. Uh, Adnan's saying um, you, ha you can't book directly. Uh, I mean, obviously I can, but I'm, I'm an instructor. I'm, I'm a CCSI, and uh, I, I was set up a long, long time ago as far as having a dCloud. dCloud and Sandbox. Uh, I think Sandbox is, is also a, a, a still alive, but I don't know if you have to have special privilege for that either. Uh, you would ask me that. Um, they want to know what the memory type is. Um I think they're DDR3. Um, actually, I need to go to the server. Nah, but it's just utilization. One second. One second. I, I've got. I've got a, a one of. I actually had to replace a dim. So give me just one second, and I'll check. Uh, 
Oh. Sorry about that. Let me, I'll just go to the horse's mouth. These are the replacements, but the type is the same. PC4, 2133P. Let me see if I can. So this is the 16. If you, uh, I, I went from 256 to 512, so I still have to send these back. So that's the, that's the ones I'm using. So not exactly high end chips or or dims, but, but I think those are fours. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to leave that on. Yeah. And I bought, you know, my 630, like I said, it was, it was $2,900, but the, the price has dropped a little bit on eBay. Yes, DDR. Thanks, Bupender. Bupender knows everything. And I don't mean that in a bad way. DDR4. Yeah, I thought they were four. Yeah, PC4 is DDR4. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, did you enjoy the session? If so, you know, shoot me a like. Give me give me a comment again. Um, next Saturday, damn, we went two hours again. Next Saturday uh, will be one of the three topics that we talked about, possibly four. The T lock, I like. I like the T lock. I mean, T lock uh, um, AAR or uh, central or local. I'm sorry, data or control plane policies. Those would be really cool. So again, if you're watching this in a replay, go ahead and you know chime in in the chat what what you would like to see the next one about. And um, so I guess we'll see. Uh, I'm done uh, with you guys. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are done with me, unless there's any other questions. I'll keep doing these as long as you guys keep showing up. Um, there's a YouTube, uh, there's a YouTube video on, uh, my channel that shows you how to build your own home DNA center, it walks you through the installation and everything. So, um, if I, um, let me drag this off. So if I go to youtube.com. Uh, Terry Benson, two times CCIE, and we take a look at, um, I created an entire series of videos about how to add a, um, sorry, you guys need to share. There we go. So, uh, this is my YouTube channel and you look here, I've got the route leaking. That's the last live session. I went ahead and added that to the build your own home lab, ser lab series. So uh, in this series right here, we've got um, how to build the virtual DNAC, uh, how to um, uh, implement the uh, access to it, and building the ICE engine. We also have um, integrating the ICE engine, and then we have the uh, um, how to add the the. the the 3650 and then the next the this session and the last session I'm I'm tacking on to the end of this. So that's a playlist. All right. Take care, Adnan. So that's pretty oh, I don't want to do that. All right, guys. I think we're done. Appreciate your attention and I'll talk to you guys uh, next Saturday, I guess. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull the plug. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. Didn't mean to take up so much of it. I'm going to end the broadcast. I'll, I'll hang around the chat for a little bit.